Hello, I'm Dan Key. I'm an attorney here in Paducah. I am going to be presenting to you today, along with Zach McMillan, another attorney here, a program on real estate and real estate law and how it applies to those that are purchasing a home, whether you're a first time home buyer or, or you're having a uh, situation where you are maybe buying a second or third home or whatever, the uh, rules and regulations generally run the same. So uh, what we would like to do today is talk about how to get the process started. And I guess the first process is you have the intention to buy the house and find a residential uh, structure that you've decided that you want. So the first item that is required is a purchase contract. Now, Zach, if you could explain a little about what uh, goes into a purchase contract and uh, uh, tell the people at home what they have to look for. Sure, Dan. Uh, first, I'd like to explain that the purchase contract is probably the most important step in a real estate transaction. That's because whenever the parties sit down to draft up the purchase contract, the terms that they put into that contract are going to control all of the next steps throughout the whole transaction until the property is actually sold. Now, purchase contracts are just like any other contracts that can contain various terms, but certain things are absolutely required. Uh, the most important terms of the contract would be the parties, identifying the parties, who's selling the property, who's buying the property. Also, the description of the property that's being bought and sold needs to be included in the contract. Uh, under Kentucky law as well, the person selling the property, if they're married, their, sp their spouse must be included on the contract because they're required to sign the contract. The contract should be signed by the people selling and the people buying. Okay, and sometimes in these purchase contracts, you get some special conditions or special uh, items that m may not normally go with real estate because uh, under the contract, the real estate is for the structure and all the appurtenances and all the built-ins. And can you explain a little bit about what might be considered a built-in and what might not be considered a built-in? Sure, what you're talking about there is what's, the legal term for that is fixtures. And fixtures are things that are considered attached to the real estate. Generally, any fixtures, when a property is sold, they stay with the real estate. And then non-fixtures, the seller can take them with them when they sell the house. Uh, Common things that are fixtures or things that are permanently attached to the house, like a window air conditioning unit might be considered a fixture. Sometimes refrigerators or other units that are built in with shelving to a home in a kitchen are considered fixtures. Uh, there, and again, with the purchase contract, you can put in any terms that you wish. The best practice is to list the things that are included with the sale of the home, whether the refrigerator is being sold, the washer dryer, all those things can be listed in the actual contract themselves and they should be. That way when you get to the closing table and the property is actually going to be sold, there's no confusion as to what the people are actually buying. Yeah, that's right and I've had situations where parties have bickered over a swing set or a dog pen or a dog houses and these are the type of things that you want to make sure that you've got set out in there so there's no question. Well, Once we've got the contract, then it's time to determine how we're going to finance this, whether it's going to be a cash uh, transaction, whether it's going to be an owner financing where the seller will actually finance the purchase for the buyer, whether it will be a institutional type uh, financing such as you go to a bank or a lending institution or a mortgage broker or any other type. Now, probably the, the most common is an institutional finance, but also we have lots of owner financing. Now, can you explain a little bit about what happens in an owner financing situation? Sure. With owner financing, the person who's actually selling the property is going to be helping the buyer finance the transaction. Uh, there's several ways to do that. A common way to do it is by what's called a vendor's lien deed. There, the person who's selling the property enters into a contract basically with the person who's buying it whereby the person has to pay back the purchase price of the house to the seller over time 
and the terms of that are listed in the deed itself. So basically your seller becomes the bank uh, and he's put in that position and there are some other methods too if the seller may not think that the buyer has the best credit or is uh, unable to get money at the bank uh, sometimes what they will do is they will not actually transfer the deed but they will contract to transfer the deed once the house has either been paid off or a certain portion of the monthly payments have been made to bring the principal balance down so these are other methods uh, that they use uh, but for the purposes of this most people go to the bank and they go uh, contract with a lending institution or a mortgage broker and uh, negotiate a, a rate and there are many types of loans out there and I know we talk about different types of loans uh, let's say I went to the bank what would be my options for types of loans well basically with most residential purchases that we see people get a fixed rate which means their interest rate is not adjustable it's fixed at one percentage rate without it's not subject to change a fixed term loan which is the term of the loan is over a definite period of years generally a 30-year fixed rate loan is what we see now there's other types of loans there's revolving credit loans that work much like a credit card it allows the person who's borrowing money to borrow up to a maximum amount of money and the interest rate is variable kind of like with your credit card payments you borrow up to a certain amount of money and then you pay it back at an interest rate uh, there's many many other types of financing and all the local lenders at the local lending institutions have you know different packages that they can offer people and anyone interested in any of these types of loans should go contact someone at a lender to find out what's available okay we've got uh, an example of of a let's say that I have five percent that I want to pay down and I want to borrow the remainder over a period of time uh, and I'm a veteran uh, so would I be qualified or able to qualify for a uh, certain type of loan that may be veteran uh, guaranteed or VA backed? Yes, that's true. Certain types of lenders who meet certain, or I'm sorry, certain types of borrowers who meet certain qualifications can get federally backed loans. Uh, what you're describing there is a VA or Veterans Affairs loan. If you're a veteran or the spouse or dependent child of a veteran, you can maybe not dependent child, but if you're the spouse of a veteran, you can get a loan that's backed by the federal government and they'll, basically what happens is the federal government insures the bank should you default under the loan. Uh, it provides somewhat of an insurance to the bank itself and allows the bank to give that borrower maybe a better rate than they would otherwise because the loan is backed. There's other types of loans that work similar. Uh, in Kentucky, there's a thing called a KHC loan. It's the Kentucky Housing Corporation. It's available to a lot of first-time home buyers, and they back those loans, and same kind of deal. It allows the bank to make loans at better rates than it might otherwise could to that borrower. Also, there's FHA loans, and the same kind of deal. They're backed by the federal government, and uh, they're operated under the Federal Housing Authority. Some of these loans that you just talked about are basically uh, for certain individuals and they're usually a assumable loans which means that when you sell the property you can sell it to someone else who may also be like qualified and can assume that loan where they don't have to expend the money initially to go out and create uh, another loan and uh, it saves money for the uh, seller uh, generally because he can get uh, maybe a little extra money there from the buyer uh, and the buyer because the buyer doesn't have to come up with the uh, with the closing costs initially. Uh, well, we've got we've talked about that. Can you explain a little bit about points? You hear the term points uh, described a lot when you talk about some of these types of loans. What is a point? Well, basically what a point is, 
That is a borrower prepaying money to the bank to get a lower interest rate. So if I went into a bank and the bank was offering me a flat interest rate of six and a half percent and I was willing to pay the bank money up front to get that interest rate lowered to five and a half percent, what I'd be basically doing is paying points down on the mortgage to lower my interest rate. Uh, that can be a good thing or a bad thing. It kind of depends on how long you have the loan. Uh, you know, and every situation is different. It depends on the purposes you're taking the loan for and how long you plan on paying it back, whether paying extra money up front is in your best interest or not. Okay, well, when you, when you come to the final conclusion and you've decided that you've determined the type of loan that you are going to obtain, uh, your lender will at that time give you what they call a good faith estimate of your closing costs. And that good faith estimate is not an actual number, but it gives you a really good idea of how much cash you're going to have to bring to closing uh, to let you know whether you can actually afford the loan. But once you have come to this point and sign a lock-in agreement that you're going to pay uh, this interest rate for this period of time for this money borrowed and whether there's other charges up front, such as a mortgage insurance premium because you haven't paid 20% uh, down. Uh, then we get into a situation where uh, the bank will start uh, a due diligence process along with the purchaser. Now, can you tell some of the things that the bank will require to guarantee that you do have good title to the property, that it is, that you have good credit, et cetera? So, if you could explain some of the things that the banks require. Okay. Different lenders obviously require different things and to be honest there's a myriad of different things that different lenders require but the most common things that we see is that uh, the borrower, the bank is going to require that a credit report be done on that borrower to make sure that they have good credit. Uh, the bank will require that a title exam is performed on the property itself. Now what that does a attorney or a title examiner will look at the ownership of the property and all the previous owners within a specific period of time and make sure that their ownership is good and that there's no outstanding liens or encumbrances against the property. Basically what they're trying to determine is if the title to the property is marketable which means it's good there's no problems with it basically. Uh, on top of that the bank will require an insurance policy which is called a lender's policy which protects the bank uh, should there be a problem with the title to the property that couldn't have been found during a title exam. Uh, those type of things generally include if a deed or another instrument was uh, procured by fraud or under duress. Uh, generally the person doing the title exam wouldn't be able to look at the document itself and be able to determine that. So that insurance would kick in should there be that kind of problem and will protect the bank up to the amount of the loan. Uh, some other things that are required, the bank will probably do an appraisal of the property to determine its value before they'll lend money. They might require a survey to be done of the property to make sure the boundaries are as they say they are and make sure there's no encroachments over those boundaries. That's some of the main things. You, know, you have, depending upon the properties themselves, uh, the bank may require certain other tests, and these aren't normal, but if you're on a well, the bank may require a well report, or if the property has a septic tank rather than uh, hooked up to a municipal sewer uh, system, they may require a septic tank report, or, and many times you will see that a termite letter or a... Uh, an insect, uh, wood destroying insect letter may be required and we often have those because we're in an area which uh, which I guess supports a lot of termites and uh, uh, it can be very expensive uh, once a termite uh, uh, swarm I get, hits the house and goes in and does the damage the repair is uh, is very expensive so very often they will require the termite uh, inspection 
and a termite bond and a continued treatment of that to, to guarantee that that is not a problem. Uh, let's, let's talk a little bit more about the title exam and the survey. Now, a survey often is a survey where a, um, a licensed land surveyor goes out and checks the property and looks for those things that you, you talked about. But uh, a lot of times people will get confused between a plat of property and a, an actual survey. And could you explain what basically a plat of a subdivision and how that differs from an actual survey? Sure. A survey is a map of a property that's done by a licensed surveyor. Um, basically, they take the legal description in the deed and they take that description and they actually draw out the boundaries of the property. Now, when they do that, they'll actually go to the property itself and look to see if they can find whatever evidence there is of the boundary lines. Usually those are marked by concrete posts or metal posts. Uh, it's different from a plat. A plat is something that's actually recorded at the courthouse. A survey is not necessarily recorded. What a plat is, it shows lot designations in, say, a subdivision. Uh, Heather Hills subdivision, for instance, here in Paducah. If you went to the courthouse, you could look up the plat for Heather Hills subdivision, and on there it would show all the individual lots. And also included in the plat are also several things such as easements that are shown on the plat, roadways that were conveyed to the county at the time that the plat was created, and any other things that might affect the property. Plats a lot of times will also include uh, subdivision restrictions. These are things that the people who subdivided the property uh, wrote out, and basically they control the use of the property. Uh, a common type of restriction would be like a minimum building line where if someone was going to build a house on a lot in that subdivision they couldn't do it except 45 feet back from the street. If anything was closer than that then that would violate that restriction. So basically what would the survey would do is the surveyor would have a copy of the plat of the subdivision knowing that you have some building setback lines and then when he comes in and spots the improvements such as the house or or a garage or whatever he makes sure that there are no encroachments over that uh, side or front or rear building line and also you can uh, sometimes the use restrictions on a uh, on a subdivision plat or subdivision restrictions can be identified because uh, the surveyor will recognize the fact that someone is using a parcel of real estate that in a manner that that violates the uh, subdivision restrictions. Well now we've got all of the due diligence uh, completed and now we have the approval of the uh, of the borrowers. Now we also have lots of things to do once this approval has been obtained. The first one is to set a closing date and let's talk a little bit about a closing but first of all what is the purpose of a closing can you go into some detail on that sure what a closing is that's when all the parties to the transaction come together and sign off on their respective part of the transaction the sellers in the transaction will sell off that they're selling the property and all the things that go along with selling the property and the buyers will come in and if they're obtaining a, a loan from a bank, we'll sign all the loan documents and everything else that the bank requires, as well as signing the deed. Uh, under Kentucky law, the buyers are required to sign the deed to swear that the actual amount they're paying for the property is the amount that's stated in the deed. And that's, that's true. That was, that was placed in the law in 1990 because there were some people uh, that were not paying their pro rata share of property taxes. Now you find that a little hard to imagine here, but uh, uh, there were some studies that were done and uh, determined that uh, folks were not showing the actual fair cash value or the sales price on the deeds. They would show for a dollar plus other, 
and not mention the amount so that the property was not being assessed as it should have been and consequently the communities and the school systems were not receiving their fair share of the uh, of the taxes uh, assessed to the real estate. So that was a little background on why they changed that deed. Well we've got our date set now we uh, we have certain other obligations. We have to uh, review the title exam and obtain payoffs of the mortgages that the title exam revealed. We have to check our taxes and uh, verify that the uh, taxing authority has not reassessed the property so that we can do what we call a proration of, uh, of taxes and uh, any other items that the lender may require will need to be obtained and brought to closing such as a homeowner's insurance policy you need to obtain a binder uh, a lot of times lenders will obtain certain tax information from the purchaser but they will they will want the purchaser to actually bring the uh, income tax return forms and maybe the w-2s if they have not been provided to the closing so they can be made a part of the package. Uh, you will, the closing entity, whether it's a bank, whether it's a, an attorney or a title company or whoever actually does the closing, they will be uh, obtaining all of the figures from the various entities that have dealt or provided services such as your survey, such as your appraisal. Uh, if there was a realtor involved, they will be in contact with the realtor to obtain their fees and one thing interesting about these payoffs on mortgages since the uh, Patriot Act and the privacy laws of recent years uh, the lending institutions normally will not give out payoffs unless you have a written signed authorization so this has created a lot of problems within the closing arena uh, I, I mentioned a term called prorating taxes can you explain what prorating taxes is? Sure. Prorating taxes, a lot of people might be familiar with the term proration if they've ever rented a place before. If you've leased an apartment and say that you moved in in the middle of the month, a lot of times the landlord will allow you to prorate the rent for that month where you're only paying half that month's rent because you only have possession of the place for half of the month. Uh, the same thing applies to taxes. If something is bought or sold any time other than when the day that the tax bill is due, then part of that tax bill is going to be the responsibility of the person selling it, and the other part will be the responsibility of the person buying it. Say, if I bought a house today, and today is April 24th, the seller should pay the amount of the 2007 tax bill from January 1st up until today's date, and then I'd be responsible for the part of the tax bill from tomorrow up until the end of the year or whenever I should have possession of the property. And how is that accomplished on a settlement statement? Well, the settlement statement is a federally mandated piece of paper and what it explains, it explains all the money that's coming into the closing and all the money that's leaving the closing. Uh, basically, everywhere that there's money coming or going, it shows up on the settlement statement or HUD-1 as it's often called. Uh, there's a separate side for the seller in the transaction and a separate side for the buyer in the transaction and all the buyers expenses show up on the hood and all the sellers expenses show up on the hood. The way the taxes work is that the seller will have an expense for his part of the taxes that he has to pay and the buyer will get a credit for that expense and then the buyer will go ahead and pay his part of the taxes and that will show up as an expense on his side of the hood and that's how that works on the hood. So basically what you do is you net out the monies to the buyer and the seller on this HUD-1 and so the seller just receives one check and that's his net proceeds and the buyer brings one check to the closing and generally that's a uh, cashier's check unless other arrangements have been made or unless the monies are wired in uh, to closing. Uh, another thing that you do uh, pre-closing is you prepare closing documents, one of which was the uh, document that uh, 
Zach spoke about, the HUD-1. You'll also have deeds, mortgages, notes, and what other lending requirements, uh, whether it's an in-house loan from the bank or whether it's a secondary mortgage or secondary market mortgage, uh, there are certain requirements that are, uh, or certain forms that are required to be signed at closing. And when we get to closing, the buyer and the seller will show up. The buyer will bring, a, bring this cashier's check and any other documentation that the lender requires. And a, explain about how long a closing will last in your experience. They don't take very long. A, generally, and this is, goes back to the importance of the purchase contract, all the important terms of a transaction should be listed in the contract. And that, when you enter into that contract, it sets up all the events that happen thereafter moving towards the closing. Now, by the time you get to the closing, if there's no outstanding issues, which hopefully you've taken care of all the issues that you foresee that might come up before the closing happens. So w normal closing where there's no issues to be resolved uh, shouldn't take more than an hour. And that is including the, uh, generally anymore the longest part of a closing if the buyer is borrowing money from a bank. Uh, there's a lot of forms that have to be signed uh, for the bank's purposes and a lot of that has to do with the federal government and uh, you know certain identity requirements that they have since 9-11 and just other federal laws you know the federal government likes to keep track of where money's coming from and going you know more so than ever and that part of the transaction generally takes the longest the sellers side they come in they generally sign the HUD one and the deed and maybe a couple other bank requirements uh, such as the affidavit of indemnity saying that they don't know of any liens against the property, but their side generally only takes a few minutes. Okay. Then after everything's signed, generally the buyer and the seller want to talk, you know, sit down and talk about exchanging keys, those type of things that they haven't done so already, and any other issues that might be going on. Okay, so after we've closed it, then we have a couple of things to do post-closing. We make sure the documents are recorded. We make sure that the payoffs are all sent out to pay off the existing mortgages. and the buyer will receive their deed in the mail and the seller gets their check and goes on to reinvest it or to do whatever. So we have gone through today uh, and explained in pretty quick detail uh, what happens from the purchase of a real estate through uh, the contract all the way through closing and post-closing. Dan, if I could, there's one other thing that we might not have mentioned that's extremely important. Anytime someone buys property, it's highly recommended that they get a home inspection. Now, we talked a little bit about the title inspection, and what that does, that deals with the ownership to the property. It doesn't say anything about the condition of any improvements, such as a house that might, you know, exist on the property. Now, a home inspection does just that. A licensed home inspector will go to the house, actually look at the condition of the house, check the appliances and anything else that's stated in their contract to make sure that everything's in good working order. And that is immensely important when someone goes to buy a house. Sure. Okay, well thank you very much.